everyone. The Coordinating Center for the National Drug Early Warning System, sponsored by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, is pleased to welcome you to our November Endus Presents webinar. This is our final webinar for 2019, so we're glad you were able to join us today for our webinar on perspectives of vaping-related lung injury from two poison centers. Our Endus PI is Dr. Eric Wish, and our NIDA project scientist is Moira O'Brien. I believe that both of them are in the audience with us this afternoon. My name is Erin Johnny, and Deuce Kowai. Barbara Kerr, Marwa Al Nasir, and I will be the facilitators for this webinar. We are all part of the Endus Coordinating Center team based here at CSER at the University of Maryland in College Park. For those who are interested, you can find detailed information about Endus, recordings of prior webinars, and invitations to future webinars on our website at www.endus.org. You will also find instructions for how to join our Endus network and participate in ongoing discussions with more than 1,600 experts and concerned citizens from across the United States and many other countries, including a discussion that's been ongoing for several months now on vaping and vaping-related lung injury. We developed the Endus Presents webinars to work with leading substance abuse experts to explore emerging drugs and timely drug-related topics. Today, we are excited to be joined by the medical directors from Poison Centers in Pittsburgh and New Jersey. Our first presenter will be Dr. Michael Lynch from the Pittsburgh Poison Center. He will be followed by Dr. Diane Colello from the New Jersey Poison Information and Education System. We collaborated with Dr. Lynch and Dr. Colello as part of our ongoing efforts to monitor the growing number of cases of e-cigarette or vaping related lung injury across the country. For more information, on this topic, please also be sure to check out our new Timely Topics video with Dr. Michelle Peace, which is available on our website at endus.org. This webinar will be approximately 60 minutes long, and we encourage you to submit questions during and after the presentation. Please, however, do not raise your hand. Instead, we ask that you please post your questions in the Q&A box and submit them in writing. We will hold a Q&A session after both of the presentations are complete. Our presenters, Barbara Marwa and I, will do our best to get to all of your questions, and we will try to address any remaining questions after the webinar. A recording of this webinar and copies of our presenter slides will be made available on our website at www.endus.org. Look for them under the Resources tab. Thank you, and we hope you enjoyed this Endus webinar. Dr. Lynch, I'll turn it over to you now. Well, thank you very much uh, for hosting us. Um, happy to uh, speak to everyone about this topic. Um, Diane and I have uh, been discussing and uh, we'll just talk about some of the, the experiences we've had in the poison center world. Um, but just as an introduction, I uh, want to back up and talk a bit more about e-cigarettes and vaping in general and uh, some of the traditional risks uh, as well as uh, the newer risk uh, associated with E-Valley. Uh, so e-cigarettes were, uh, the first models actually date back to the 1920s, um, but the, the more recent uh, e-cigarette models or design uh, were developed by a Chinese pharmacist, uh, Han Lick, in 2003. You'll often refer, see them referred to as electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDS, or E-N-D-E-S. Uh, the first generation of which uh, were these Sigalikes, uh, in fact, I included the picture here of Johnny Depp uh, from a movie called The Tourist uh, because I, I remember it came out in 2010 was the first time I actually ever saw one uh, and, and went and had to look up what it was that he was doing, uh, pulling on this plastic thing with a blue light on the end. So how does it work? Um, it's initiated either by inspiration, so a trigger uh, with a negative pressure, or some models will have a button or manual control. Um, and regardless of how it's triggered, uh, what happens is a, a battery, uh, often a lithium ion battery within the device, activates a heating coil. Uh, and that heating coil is located adjacent to a cartridge or tank uh, that holds the liquid uh, traditionally and classically uh, containing nicotine fluid, um, but as we have seen and will see, uh, contain many other things as well. Uh, and when it heats that liquid, uh, typically with a solvent and, and the chemical drug uh, of interest, it releases a vapor uh, that the patient inhales. 
Uh, other types of things you'll sometimes hear are called drip, dripping. Uh, what that has to do is actually um, putting a couple of drops directly on the coil itself and then putting the uh, mechanism back together and inhaling it that way. It sort of concentrates uh, the vapor as opposed to the traditional mechanism. Uh, or dabbing, which usually does not uh, involve the device, though it's often uh, used, you know, the terminology is used together, it has to do with a concentrate, typically THC concentrate, that will be placed on something very hot. Uh, it's been heated with butane or something like that. Uh, in, in some cases, when you read online, they'll talk about nails or other pieces of metal, um, and then you put a small amount of that concentrate on top uh, and then inhale the vapor that comes off of there uh, as another way of concentrating uh, the contents, again, typically with THC uh, in that scenario. So what do they look like? Um, you know, they can look all over the map, and I'm guessing most of us just in the course of our daily lives uh, have seen variations on these. I, quite frankly, I don't know that I've ever seen an e-pipe, um, but that, that was interesting uh, to me. Uh, E-cigars, we see some of these large kind of tank devices um, fairly frequently. There are disposable e-cigarettes, so little one-time use uh, e-cigarettes then can be thrown away. Um, the larger tanks uh, come with tanks that you can buy concentrated refills uh, of fluid uh, to fill the tank again and continue to use the same device. Uh, that is, leads to one of the concerns, uh, particularly with concentrated nicotine fluids uh, that I'll talk more a bit about in a bit. Um, you know, you can get fairly large volumes of liquid with concentrated nicotine uh, to refill those. Um, lately, as far as looking at market share and what is often uh, discussed both in popular media and quite frankly with my own kids, uh, the oldest of which was in middle school, uh, are Jules. Uh, Jules are a name brand uh, specifically. They generally look like flash drives and can be fairly easily disguised. Uh, so the pot itself is very small um, and uh, is plugged into the, the larger device, but it's small, it's flat, it can be easily sort of contained in the palm of your hand. Uh, there may or may not be much of a vapor plume, so these things, you know, we know are used in classrooms, uh, let alone in bathrooms and things like that. Uh, there are various, uh, you know, sweatshirts and other uh, types of apparel that have been designed to actually hide these things in uh, so that they can be used sort of right out in the open, uh, but also hidden. Um, but, but Jules in particular uh, have done a lot of advertising um, and, and are, are very uh, popular and commonly used, uh, again, with the largest market share of any single device. So what is in these e-cigarette vaping uh, devices or liquids? Um, all sorts of things is really the answer. Uh, nicotine, again, traditionally is what uh, people have been looking to get uh, with e-cigarettes um, exposures. I think uh, it's important to understand that the concentrations uh, can vary significantly. Uh, when you think of it as a sort of a, a tobacco cessation tool, uh, if it's going to be used that way, uh, which we'll talk more about the evidence for that uh, a bit later, um, it would make sense that you would have the ability to uh, decrease the concentration and, and amount that you're using, much like patches of varying uh, doses, et cetera. Um, but some of them are very highly concentrated and more so than a traditional cigarette uh, with some of the disposable devices. Uh, and the jewels, as we mentioned, uh, those little cartridges, uh, one of those will actually contain a similar amount of nicotine as a full pack of 20 cigarettes. Uh, so when we talk about especially adolescent use and the uh, potential for addiction to nicotine, it's quite high as use of a very small amount uh, and a very short period of time can expose the individual to a very large amount of nicotine. Other things that we see, ultrafine particles, which can vary depending on device and liquid, uh, volatile organic compounds uh, and, and, um, and metals. Uh, the volatile organic compounds that are most common are propylene glycol and diethylene glycol, as well as glycerin. Uh, the concentrations of those relative to each other, uh, you know, will have some effect on the viscosity uh, and potentially on uh, lung-associated effects. With propylene glycol and diethylene glycol in particular, we have uh, good historical evidence of the toxicity of those related to ingesting, ingesting 
um, liquid, uh, like drinking liquids of those, um, but less so with the inhalation of the product. Uh, so that will be one of the things that over time, long term, uh, you know, cohorts of individuals uh, are currently being developed to follow over time to see what effects uh, those chemicals may have um, with a long-term vaping habit. Other chemicals that can be associated with chronic illness, things like formaldehyde and acid aldehyde, uh, can affect uh, the way that our body sort of produces energy and cellular mechanisms. Uh, again, as we know, with formaldehyde long-term uh, associated with chronic disease, uh, with, um, with exposures in occupational settings, uh, the degree and concentration of these will vary across products. Uh, is often unknown or unreported uh, as, a, as, as one of the ingredients, uh, so people may or may not know w that they're being uh, exposed to it. And again, what the long-term effects of those may be uh, related to vaping is unclear. With uh, e-cigarettes as well, the, uh, there have been uh, metals identified uh, in the vapor and uh, in the uh, um, uh, in individuals who use uh, vaping devices at higher levels. They, those have included tin, lead, and nickel. Uh, nickel in particular is interesting as nickel carbonyl uh, is one of the metals uh, that's uh, especially associated with uh, a certain, you know, certain acute lung injuries with inhalation. Uh, I don't have it listed here, but cadmium um, has also been identified, which uh, can also be associated with illness and potentially lung injury. Flavoring, uh, you know, we know there's been a lot of attention paid uh, towards flavoring, discussion about regulation of flavoring, and sort of back and forth on that. Um, and, and it's actually, uh, you know, pretty important from a number of perspectives. Uh, some of the flavoring, uh, you know, diacetyl, 2,3-propanediol, menthol, eugenol, cinnamaldehyde, uh, limonene, these have all been associated with various types of uh, lung injuries, uh, particularly acute. Diacetyl in particular um, is associated with something called popcorn lung or uh, bronchiolitis obliterans, organizing pneumonia, uh, and that diacetyl where that popcorn lung name comes from isn't a pa uh, pathologic thing. That's not what the lungs look like. Uh, it's because that was used as a buttering flavor, and individuals who worked in the industry of popcorn production and using diacetyl for flavoring, that buttery flavoring, uh, developed this uh, relatively rare or uncommon type of lung injury, uh, which differs uh, for the most part uh, compared to the lung injuries that we're seeing in the current E. Valley cases. And one of the important problems or concerns with flavoring is the targeting and the um, sort of uh, uh, attraction to kids and adolescents. 81% uh, of adolescents cite flavoring as the primary reason uh, for their use of a vaping device. So um, if we consider adolescent vaping uh, to be something we, uh, we don't consider a good endpoint, uh, then flavoring certainly has to be a consideration of that. And you can see uh, just some of the advertising. Honestly, ad advertising online and social media is another really important uh, topic that I don't get into here uh, and how it's advertised, particularly to, uh, to younger uh, potential customers um, or, or victims. Uh, and even adults, so, you know, we tend to focus on the adolescents, but even adults, uh, report flavoring as a significant part of their utilization of vaping materials, uh, as well as in, uh, you know, contributing to their own perceived addiction to uh, vaping and, and the vaping products. So what is the toxicity of vaping? Um, you know, independent of E-Valley, uh, which we'll talk about more, uh, nicotine toxicity is its, in itself uh, quite dangerous. Um, it works in a different way than organophosphates and we think of nerve gases and VX and pesticides that are organophosphates. Uh, they work in a different way, but the overall effect uh, in clinical presentation can actually look fairly similar uh, with fluid building up in the lungs, fast followed by slow heart rate, muscle weakness, uh, seizures, coma, et cetera. Um, it can be very severe. It uh, can be absorbed via the skin, so it doesn't necessarily have to be inhaled or drunk uh, across mucous membranes and definitely uh, through ingestion. Uh, in one uh, series or review of uh, case reports of 31 
intentional and accidental exposures uh, to concentrated nicotine fluids, uh, about a third of those resulted in death. Uh, and what they saw was that in, in young children, they were generally accidental. Um, there was a, uh, a popular media report uh, that came out uh, several years ago of a toddler in New York who died after exposure to um, a concentrated nicotine fluid. Uh, or as they get into the adolescent or uh, you know, older than 10 years old, they're primarily used as suicide uh, attempts. Uh, and again, with a third dying, uh, is a very dangerous uh, potential exposure. Beyond the nicotine itself uh, and the concentrate in the fluids, uh, bronchospasm and a link to asthma, um, you know, associated with the ultrafine particles and the irritant effect itself um, of, of vaping or inhaling essentially anything um, uh, out, of, out of the ordinary. Organizing pneumonia or popcorn lung we, we discussed. There was actually also a case I think I saw recently out of Canada uh, that reported uh, a bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia or popcorn lung uh, that was uh, they associated with vaping. And then the chronic effects, and we're still trying to figure this out. You know, the, the first um, devices uh, are, have only been on the market in, in the U.S. for 10 to 12 years now, uh, and really the explosion of popularity uh, has really been over the last five to six to seven years. So we don't really know for sure what the chronic effects are of uh, vaping and inhaling these, uh, these various liquids and using different devices. Um, you know, each step along the pathway, whether it be the fluid, the device itself, the, the metals uh, and the mechanisms of the device, and then individual susceptibilities, uh, what combinations of those factors uh, may contribute to a long-term either carcinogenic or other lung disease like COPD uh, is really unclear. Um, and so we're sort of, uh, you know, using the large numbers of people now to hopefully start to understand and follow over time uh, to understand what those effects may be, uh, as well as secondhand exposure. We know that, uh, th that those uh, exposed to secondhand uh, vapor uh, do find uh, detectable levels of some of the chemicals associated with the vape products. Uh, so we know it's a phenomenon where I live in Allegheny County. Um, it has been treated much like cigarette smoking uh, as far as vaping in public places uh, has been restricted. Another um, interesting sort of not exactly toxicologic uh, impact from these uh, are actually burn or blast injuries. Uh, the University of Washington uh, actually published a report of 15 cases uh, that they had uh, over the course of, a, of, of less than a year from 2015 to 2016. This was in the New England Journal of Medicine of, of blast and burn injuries of uh, these vaping devices, either from getting wet uh, or corroding, uh, either in pockets or when being used, um, you know, so that they saw flame injuries as well as chemical and blast injuries distributed uh, to the face and hands with those who were using the device uh, versus the thigh or groin uh, for individuals uh, for whom it happened while it was sitting in their pockets. Uh, the FDA um, ha uh, released uh, this sort of um, image to, to help with that particular uh, part or uh, potential injury associated with uh, vape devices. We haven't seen this necessarily with jewels and others, but some of the older tank um, cartridges uh, and devices. Uh, so, you know, using safety features, button locks so it, it's not continuing to be activated, um, keeping loose batteries uh, in a case so that they don't contact, uh, not charging the, the vape device uh, with a phone or tablet charger, uh, so some of these are chargeable. Um, and, and if they're not meant uh, to be used on other high, higher powered or longer duration uh, charging um, cords, uh, it could increase the risk, uh, not charging it overnight, and then replacing it uh, with batteries if they get damaged or wet. Uh, so those are recommendations from the FDA. But in addition to those sort of short and long-term toxic uh, effects or potential toxic effects of vaping, um, you know, one of the most concerning elements of this has been the absolute explosion of adolescent vaping. Uh, so from 2017 to 2019, the number of teens who currently vape doubled uh, in that really short time period. Uh, and this uh, 
this is from New England Journal of Medicine, this table, and I, I understand it's a bit busy, um, but going down they have essentially three groups, uh, so past 30 days or current uh, vapors, and then the bottom group is any who have ever vaped, uh, and asking these kids in 12th, 10th, and 8th grade. So of 12th graders, uh, they report that a quarter are currently vaping, or almost 10% of 8th graders are currently vaping. And more than 40% of 12th graders have ever vaped, uh, and one in five or more than 20% of 8th graders have vaped. Um, so again, with the high concentration and uh, the highly addictive nature of nicotine, uh, and assuming that that's nicotine, uh, the, those numbers are really quite staggering. And even if we didn't think that vaping itself uh, was risky, and I think that while we're trying to answer the degree to which it may be risky, uh, we all understand that there are risks associated with it, uh, both immediate and likely long-term. Um, we all agree, I think, as a society, uh, that smoking combustible cigarettes uh, is dangerous to short and long-term health. And when we think about the trends in cigarette smoking and uh, the trends in vaping, uh, one of the really large concerns is uh, that adolescents who vape are three and a half to four and a half times more likely to begin smoking combustible cigarettes, um, either experimentally or frequently. Uh, and so when we think about that, this is the curve over time. We see back in 1976, nearly 30% of 12th graders um, uh, were smoking, uh, smoking daily. And the curves, uh, really starting in the late 90s, do exactly what we would have wanted them to do. Uh, they fall, and they fall fairly rapidly to the point now where uh, fewer than 4% of 12th graders uh, are, are daily smokers. Uh, but that red line of vaping use uh, by 12th graders, and considering the fact that they would be much more likely to go on to smoke cigarettes, all of this work that we've spent decades educating and figuring out the ways to educate our youth, you know, trying to make it less cool, uh, social media, uh, cinema, all of those things, um, you know, the concern is that that work could be undone uh, as, as the perceived harms and risks are lost and the addiction to, to, bat or to nicotine uh, is, is increased again. The primary argument for, you know, uh, for vaping and utilization of these devices has been as a smoking cessation aid. And, you know, while I agree that if they worked to uh, help individuals quit smoking, uh, and put next to each other, it seems that cigarettes are more, are certainly more dangerous, or at least known definitively to be more dangerous than vaping. Then as a harm reduction sort of uh, approach, you would prefer that individuals transition from cigarette smoking to vaping, and ideally to discontinuation of nicotine use. Um, but in looking back at a meta-analysis in Lancet, um, what they found is that overall, uh, in, in the combination of studies that they reviewed, uh, they actually saw a lower likelihood of uh, tobacco cessation and actually an increased risk of cigarette use and e-cigarette use at the same time. And there have been other studies that have demonstrated that the toxins identified with smoking cigarettes, uh, many of them are also identified in individuals who vape, uh, though in lower concentrations in those who vape, but when they do both together, there is a synergistic increase on the detectability of what are uh, thought to be dangerous chemicals, including metals, uh, formaldehyde, and other chemicals. Uh, so the tobacco cessation uh, is, is certainly at best not proven, uh, and at worst, uh, it may actually harm individuals uh, who are smoking tobacco. And we also know with the millions and millions of people who are, are vaping and with uh, the 25% of 12th graders who are currently vaping, uh, that those individuals are not doing it to discontinue uh, combustible cigarette use. Beyond that, and you know, focusing on nicotine, we also know that vaping uh, has been used to, uh, for exposure to all sorts of other chemicals, most notably THC and CBD, either in combination or individually, um, and even some of the newer, more uh, powerful vape uh, pens can uh, can you can place plant material and still get a um, an inhalable uh, smoke or vapor uh, to use with it. 
So looking at this uh, survey, uh, this global survey, uh, by far uh, cannabis products uh, were, were the most common non-nicotine products uh, that were vaped. But we also see things like synthetic cannabinoids, uh, which have a, a much more dangerous profile, uh, DMT, uh, dimethyltryptamine, which is a um, uh, synthetic uh, hallucinogen, uh, methamphetamine, MDMA or ecstasy or molly, other stimulants, heroin, fentanyl. Um, these things have been vaped, and I know from speaking to our DEA in our state uh, that they have told us about cases uh, uh, and also our harm reduction specialists of people who are vaping a variety of opioids, uh, with, uh, an opioid uh, liquid uh, concentrates. Uh, so that opens up a, a, an entirely new um, avenue uh, of concern for exposure to drugs, and particularly when we think about uh, the typical concerns of ordering things online and not exactly knowing what it is that, uh, that we're getting uh, when the uh, possibility of any of these types of chemicals being present in a vape liquid, either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, is quite scary. Uh, once again, going back to thinking about 40% of adolescents who have vaped at all and the potential for unintentional exposure uh, to one of these other drugs. So with the FDA, um, you know, we're following the progress here. Uh, as of 2016, defined uh, electronic nicotine devices as tobacco products. Uh, so the FDA Center for Tobacco Products um, will, is and will be regulating e-cigarettes. Uh, Pre-market review process for products, uh, the products that had been available prior to 2016, uh, the deadline for when that needed to be completed uh, has been extended. Uh, and the last I saw, according to the FDA website, was May of 2020, uh, though currently uh, they are not available for adolescents under 18 years of age. Honestly, prior to uh, that ruling, I remember seeing these things being sold in, in kiosks in the middle of the mall to kind of to anyone. Uh, it, was, it was quite scary. Um, and then beyond that, if they're going to make a claim of tobacco cessation benefit, uh, that would fall under the uh, CEDAR, or Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, uh, and that would open up a whole other can of worms, which, again, our uh, current availability of evidence uh, does not back up that claim or certainly doesn't definitively support it. Uh, so this was actually from an old MMWR uh, before we started getting almost weekly uh, MMWR updates uh, concerning e-cigarette use. Uh, Diana and I were talking that just before going on, we saw we both got emails uh, with an update, so I had not had a chance to review that yet. Uh, so some of this data is already old, uh, as in the number of high school kids, um, you know, one in four as opposed to one in five, and middle school kids being nearly one in 10 uh, as far as ever using e-cigarettes, uh, and the current use being higher as well. Um, and the important understanding of the addiction potential and the harm to developing brain uh, really underlies and underscores the importance of the messaging and making sure we're already behind the eight ball. It's fairly clear, um, you know, so whether through, through poison centers, departments of health, uh, pediatricians, primary care physicians, asking about uh, e-cigarette and vaping uh, and, and trying to provide the education uh, about what we know, what we don't know, and the risks associated with it. I know where I live, uh, schools are um, really trying hard to catch up um, and not just punish, but sort of help individuals with understanding you know, nicotine addiction, uh, identifying use, and working with students and families uh, to, to uh, reduce and eliminate the utilization, uh, as well as working with pediatricians. And I think those are all appropriate approaches. Uh, so with that, I will um, uh, hand off to my colleague, Dr. Colello, uh, and thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, I'd just like to thank the folks at Endus for inviting us to do this and provide, um, you know, a perspective, particularly from a poison control center standpoint. Um, you know, it's been a pretty remarkable time, I'd say, the last three to four months or maybe even a little bit more when uh, we've watched the outbreak unfold. And that is part of poison center work. You know, we get a call about one thing and we think, huh, oh, that's strange. And then we get two of them and then we get three. And we realize we've got a public health issue on our hands. And so I'd like to just begin with a story 
of what um, happened here at the New Jersey Poison Center back in July. We were having our monthly case conference um, and in which we invite you know, people from all over the state to kind of come and hear interesting cases. And at the beginning of every case conference, I usually put up a few things in the news that I think are of toxicologic significance. And so I put up um, a picture of the news coverage in Wisconsin which said, you know, vaping is suspected of severely injuring lungs of eight Wisconsin teens, doctors say. And I, you know, kind of put it up on the screen and I said, you know, I just want to make everybody aware of this. We, we haven't yet heard of this uh, here at the Poison Center, but, you know, I wonder what's causing this. And a doctor from another hospital here in the state looked at it and he said, I just had one of these. Like, you know, last week I had a, a teenager come in with very severe lung injury, previously healthy, but you know, short of breath, low oxygen saturation, got very sick, ended up on a ventilator, ended up in the ICU, is still on the, in the ICU. And the only thing we could link to it is that he was, uh, was vaping and had recently gotten a cartridge from quote unquote a friend, you know, which contained uh, THC. Now, THC is not legal for retail use here in uh, retail commerce here in New Jersey. So getting th that information reliably has been difficult. But this particular patient, you know, kind of owned up to it and said, you know, here was the story. And from that moment on, I feel like we heard about a new case every time we turned around. Um, and so that's what got all of our attention, I think, at the poison control centers. And, you know, initially caused a lot of poison centers like New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Washington and even our national organization to put out an alert even before the investigation just to our, you know, everybody in our state. I sent something to the ED directors, ICU directors, um, just saying, hey, if you see this, call us. And, that, you know, poison centers can really be 24-7 uh, boots on the ground, so to speak, to capture these cases. So, as I said, the CDC, in conjunction with state health departments and in several states' poison control centers and other partners, um, began conducting the investigation. And as of last week, there's 2,290 cases reported in 49 states and 47 deaths. Um, the majority are male, um, but certainly not all. And the majority are young, meaning you know, just 15 to 35 or so, um, although the age range is wide and extends well, you know, well into the 70s. Um, but that's the typical picture of these patients. So um, the clinical findings that have been described are similar to what I described at the outset with a few um, notable features. Patients do present with shortness of breath, sometimes with chest pain or chest tightness and cough. Um, many do also have GI symptoms, so nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, um, which is not typical of a regular old inhalation injury. You know, if you just inhale some, you know, dust or something that just kind of irritates your lungs, uh, GI symptoms are unusual in that context. So it may be a clue as to some of the compounds responsible for the illness. Patients do also have fever and fatigue, and the onset of symptoms varies, but is generally not immediately after the first vaping exposure, but appears to take a few days to develop at least. Findings, meaning you know what we've seen in the clinical scenario, include hypoxemia, tachycardia. Um, sometimes you really hear nothing on uh, pulmonary exam or listening to the lungs. Um, and then a chest X-ray may demonstrate some, you know, it looks like pneumonia or consolidation or abnormalities. Um, but the uh, the modality that's most been described is CAT scan or CT scan, which demonstrates bilateral ground glass opacities, which I'll show you in a minute with peripheral sparing. Now, there have been a lot of different injury patterns described. So hypersensitivity pneumonitis, 
um, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, eosinophilic uh, pneumonitis, lipoid pneumonia. There, there are a lot of different injury patterns described um, without one being really predominant. Um, laboratory analysis may demonstrate a high white count, increased inflammatory markers, and elevation in AST and ALT, you know, which are liver enzymes, which again is a little atypical for a regular old, if you will, inhalation exposure. And, you know, the, the combination of GI symptoms with some liver injury and inhalation is, uh, or, and uh, pulmonary injury, I think is unique. So this is actually an example of a CT scan provided by my colleague on the phone, Dr. Lynch, um, which demonstrates, um, you know, ground glass opacities. So that's, these are these kind of like fine granular uh, white stuff, if you will, on the CAT scan. And then around the rim of the lung, as you can see, it's a little darker, um, and that's peripheral sparing. So you can see that peripheral sparing a little bit more pronounced here, those ground glass opacities a little bit more pronounced in the center of the lungs. And again, this is all the same patient. So identifying and confirming cases is not as simple as it seems. Uh, for example, as we move into flu season, uh, we're going to see a lot of patients with respiratory complaints. And we're going to see a lot of patients who happen to vape, but they won't always be uh, vaping-induced a lung injury and, and identifying what's what is uh, pretty complicated. Here is, for your references, the official CDC confirmed and probable case definitions. So you can see on the top, the confirmed cases have no evidence of other infection, which might explain symptoms, whereas the probable case may have a concomitant infection, but it's not believed to be the sole cause of a severe respiratory picture. So why is this happening? And you know, people have vaped for a long time and we didn't hear about these severe lung injury cases. Certainly we've talked a lot about long-term health consequences. You know, vape smoke is not just water vapor. It's not entirely benign, but something has clearly changed to bring about a dramatic outbreak of severe and in some cases fatal lung injury. So what's going on here? A lot of theories have been proposed. Uh, and some of that has to do with, as I said, there are a lot of different kinds of injury reported. Um, so the pathologic appearance of lipoid pneumonia, which is, you know, if you take a slice of lung, you see lipid-laden macrophages or cells kind of full of oil, um, suggests that perhaps when what is being inhaled and causing the injury is a lipid material or an oily material which accumulates, we see that um, not in the vaping context, but when people accidentally or even intentionally drink uh, a, a kerosene or, or a um, petroleum distillate hydrocarbon, um, that can cause a lipid-related uh, lung injury, sometimes which is lipoid pneumonia and sometimes which has a different pattern. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, is an allergic phenomenon um, and is uh, related to eosinophilic pneumonitis, which has also been reported. And that's generally with the inhalation of particulate matter or dust, like I said, and is variable, just kind of depends on the patient. And then there's the question of whether there's just a toxic component in vape smoke that causes a direct lung, lung injury because it's bad for lungs. <laughs> um, certainly the one getting most attention is vitamin E acetate due to several recent studies demonstrating that <clears throat> if you line up, you know, 29 patients, you know, and you do bronchoscopy in 29 of those samples, you find vitamin E acetate. So that was the one study I think that, you know, blew that open a lot. There have been other studies looking either at patient samples or at just the products themselves, at, which have found vitamin E, but that has not been 100%. Um, so there's still more to know, and I think a number of compounds is probably responsible. Um, there's been some talk about cyanide, which of course does cause uh, a fatal rapidly on, rapid onset of cardiovascular neurologic collapse, but there may be some um, small amounts of cyanide in the vape smoke. Chlorinated hydrocarbons um, can cause a liver injury, some GI symptoms, and lung injury, so they may be partially responsible. Dr. Lynch mentioned propylene glycol and glycerin, which is worth uh, just a special discussion because PG and glycerin are actually 
these are the solvents that are used in commercially available large market vape solution um, are involved in a, in a lot of things like even medicinal marijuana, for example, um, that can be vaporized and inhaled and are generally used because they don't cause this degree of acute lung injury. Um, and it's when something else is used that is generally seems to be the problem. But there may be something in the ratio of propylene glycol to glycerin that's not quite right that may be contributing. Uh, we already talked about heavy metals um, and uh, mixed agent reactions or just chemical reactions of the stuff once it gets in the vape pen. You know, maybe whatever it is just doesn't like being superheated and broken up into different compo you know, components and then inhaled. And uh, that's a bit of a black box right now that we don't totally understand. Um, looking at objective data, these are analyses of products that were tested um, and um, in uh, several of these studies you can see um, the majority contained THC but not all contained THC and of the THC containing products the you know more often than not contained vitamin E acetate but again this was not a hundred percent so it seems like you know if you had to point to things most likely to cause what we are now calling EVALI. Um, THC is certainly part of it, and so is vitamin E acetate, but there's definitely more to do. So how did this happen? Where did this come from, right? You know, what has changed about commerce or just the, the vaping market or uh, human behavior that's caused the outbreak? So early in the outbreak, um, this is one example of a news story that broke again in Wisconsin, interestingly, which is where I first heard the news about um, these two brothers who uh, had a large scale operation in which they would purchase or procure major amounts of empty vape cartridges, cook up their own vape oil from THC, fill the cartridge and sell it. And, um, you know, you could see that this is very different from a regulated commercially available nicotine or even marijuana vape juice. This is, you know, informal market, black market if it's illegal, you know, it's, THC is not illegal everywhere, certainly. But this is a very different kind of decision making process and regulatory environment than we encounter with other things that people can inhale, like, um, you know, the commercially available nicotine juice. So. Um, they describe this as a pen factory where they obtain material from Chinese factories. Um, you can also buy cartridges and packaging on a number of e-commerce sites. Although not all samples or patients have been demonstrated to include THC, the preponderance of cases do involve vape oil containing THC. Um, so this is a brand which has been mentioned often in the outbreak. Uh, it's not the only one. Um, and if you go on the Dank Vapes website, they have an explanation of how the illness is obviously caused by counterfeit product and not by their own product. But um, there are others. But you can see this is a THC vape oil product um, which is sold in canisters which screw onto an e-cigarette and uh, contain THC among other things. So I just want to talk a moment about how THC oil is made in general. So before this all happened, you know, the, the cannabis commerce is really undergoing a revolution. There's a lot more cannabis available in a lot of different products, right? So the smoked bud or flower weed of 30 years ago um, has now become uh, just a cornucopia of edibles and resins and waxes and highly concentrated liquid for vaporizing or for topical application and you know there's so many different ways to obtain cannabis and um, the process by which a concentrated liquid is created is interesting to this discussion regulated medical marijuana concentrates are very but are generally propylene glycol or glycerol but prior to the Evali outbreak, um, there have been a number of reports of THC being extracted into butane, you know, like lighter fluid butane, <laughs> um, and basically 
causing an explosion injury. So I don't think that's too surprising if you look at the process, which is you soak you know, the, the green, you know, the green in the figure is the leaves of the cannabis plant in a liquid solvent and allow a liquid to kind of drip out of that column into a tray where it's then heated to make it concentrated. That's how butane hash oil is created. Um, but you can imagine if you heat butane in, uh, you know, your basement or a trailer or someplace where it's not well controlled, fires happen and explosions happen. Um, so that aside, I think it does inform kind of most likely how we got here in that in order to get THC out of the plant, it's got to be soaked in something. And that something ends up being the most likely constituent of vape oil. And if that something happens to be something which shouldn't be inhaled, like vitamin E acetate or other toxic components, um, it is my belief that that's how we create this acute lung injury outbreak. And it does seem to be that that's, that's the case, the more we learn. So as for treatment, most of our public health efforts, I think, have centered around recognition, surveillance, figuring out what is causing the injury. Uh, but we do know uh, a few things that seem to be helpful, supplemental oxygen, supportive care, of course. Um, some patients have needed mechanical ventilation, and that is a decision made based on the severity of illness of the patient. Um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO, has been necessary in some cases. There is one case in the lay media of uh, lung transplantation. Um, so these are very severe lung injuries, and the therapy for them is basically supporting the patient while, and allowing the lungs to recover. Um, a number of patients, a lot of patients have gotten steroids. They seem to help in some cases. Um, so they're generally recommended, but really with no clear, obvious dose or duration that is needed in this illness. So I just want to discuss for a few minutes the role of poison control centers in the outbreak and others. Our national organization, the American Association of Poison Control Centers, um, in response to the outbreak, set up emergent codes in our centralized database for centers to identify cases as EVALI. And since that time, 622 cases have been reported. Um, in Pennsylvania, the two poison centers became the point of contact using the National 800 number. And as of October 31st, have taken calls uh, of approximately 73 cases. I'm going to let Dr. Lynch just chime in with his demographics in a moment. Um, in New Jersey, although we are certainly taking call from the, calls from the public, our hotline has been, point, had been directed at healthcare providers calling for reporting and surveillance. Um, and we actually established a separate line for that purpose. And we've taken about uh, 40 of those calls, which vary in severity and demographics. So Mike, I think you want to chime in here. Uh, yeah, thank you, Diane. Uh, just uh, to give a little bit more breakdown, uh, looking at the Pennsylvania cases, and you'll see that there's 78 total as opposed to 73 on the prior slide. Uh, those extra five actually come from Delaware. Uh, the Poison Control Center of Philadelphia uh, takes calls from Delaware as well. Uh, so, and I also want to uh, give a special shout out to the, the group at uh, Poison Control Philadelphia, Jeanette Chola, Kevin Osterhout, uh, Justin Singh, and Pak Tang, and Quan Nam. Uh, they did a lot of the data uh, search looking through all of our various reports. Uh, but there you can see uh, the age range, um, and this is what we've been seeing clinically, uh, a, a predominance of, of male patients, a little more than two-thirds. Um, more than 91% were hospitalized. And I think it's less clear uh, when patients are treated as outpatients. Uh, one, obviously, they, they don't really have a severe an illness. Uh, and two, they're less likely, I think, to be diagnosed as having e um and then treated as an outpatient. It would be presumed, given the overlap, in many cases, that they had some type of viral syndrome. In fact, my experience is that most of these patients that I care for were seen, you know, they're in an urgent care, or an ED, or primary care, diagnosed with a viral syndrome before returning to the emergency department a couple of days later. Of the 91% that were hospitalized, uh, we can see that 18% had to be intubated and several actually required VV ECMO. Uh, and that's, that's one of the first cases we had here in Pittsburgh, at least that we had identified at that time, was in early August, was an adolescent at our children's hospital who required ECMO uh, and was sort of traced back uh, and at the same time seeing the reports from uh, Wisconsin and Illinois 
uh, that we put it together. Retrospectively, we actually went back and identified a, a couple of other cases uh, prior to that uh, that would have fit the criteria and discussed with the individuals uh, who endorsed vaping and no other uh, etiology had been identified. Um, and then the urine drug testing, most did not get urine drug tests. Um, you know, 27% were positive for THC. I think uh, the, the more interesting thing is only about 5% were negative, uh, which doesn't rule out synthetic cannabinoids or use of a non-regulated, uh, or I, sh I shouldn't say regulated, but uh, an illicit or online sort of um, uh, put together uh, material or liquid. Um, but that, that was, so our, our initiation was very similar to what uh, Dr. Colello um, described in New Jersey where we were seeing the reports and then sort of by word of mouth we started hearing about more. We put out a similar uh, type of announcement to our member hospitals um, and, and including our Pennsylvania Department of Health uh, Health Advisory or Health Alert Network um, actually based on our reports to the Department of Health identified the, the poison centers as the primary um, mode of reporting these uh, for the state um, until they got their sort of response uh, mechanism uh, up and running. Uh, and we continue to work closely where we share our cases with them and they've shared several cases that we didn't know about with us to make sure that they were documented in as many different ways as possible. Uh, so w with that, uh, Dr. Colello, I'll, I'll defer back to you. Okay. Um, so just going to conclude by talking a bit about um, our centers and what we do in general, for those of you not uh, familiar or even for those of you who are, who are fans. <laughs> um, poison Control Centers are a national network. There are 55 poison centers nationwide which cover all of the U.S. and territories. Um, <clears throat> some states have more than one. Some states share a poison center. It just kind of depends on, uh, you know, census. But um, we're a 24-7 hotline which is answered by healthcare providers. Um, and uh, the hotline is the same nationally. It's available to anybody who calls, the lay public, first responders, healthcare providers, um, at law enforcement, anybody who, who needs help. And uh, the and phones are answered by nurses, pharmacists, even in some cases also physicians who with certification in poison information. And it's the in addition, backed up by continuous availability of a physician medical toxicologist for consultation, like myself and Dr. Lynch. So I like to proudly say it's one of the few places you can call and get medical advice right away without a copay. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it is obviously unbiased, but a very valuable service. We provide consultation on any toxic exposure or potential toxic exposure you may encounter. The majority, I think, are prescription drugs and illicit drugs, um, but environmental toxins from carbon monoxide to lead. Here in New Jersey, we actually handle many calls with uh, environmental lead poisoning of children. Envenomation, um, whether it's a native species of snake or scorpion or it's an exotic pet, chemical exposures, occupational exposures, and uh, radiation exposures. What do we do with the calls once we get them? We carefully document it in our own medical record system. We maintain those locally, and then those are uploaded every eight minutes to a national server, which is uh, the NPDS, National Poison Data System. We are HIPAA-exempt public health authorities, so when we call, um, although we sometimes have to remind the person that we're calling, um, you know, we can obtain the information because it's relevant to public health. And so sometimes we'll call for follow-up um, on a case that we get and just need to, you know, kind of say to the hospital, it's okay that we're calling to get more information about this patient because we're HIPAA exempt. Um, <clears throat> and then data can be shared in a lot of different ways and most often in this aggregate de-identified format for reporting purposes. That is in conjunction with partners not only our own network, um, but also the National Poison Data System, which communicates with CDC, FDA, uh, the Department of Homeland Security as an early warning system for a variety of toxic threats. Um, as I said, it's uploaded every eight minutes. Sometimes I will be busy at the New Jersey Poison Center with a bit of a situation like 
a couple years ago, we had 100 kids at a school with a carbon monoxide leak, and we got a lot of calls about a lot of kids, fortunately none of whom were sickened. Um, but it was not soon after we started getting those calls that we got a call from our CDC surveillance partner to say, you got something going on up there in New Jersey? So it really is real-time detection of trends and hazards like Evoli. Um, NPDES also compiles an annual report, which I encourage all of you to look at because it gives you a lot of vital information about the, just the epidemiology of poisonings and geographic variation of poisonings. And then tailored reports are available uh, upon request and approval by AAPCC. Um, so since um, March of 15 of 2003, this collaboration has existed to facilitate the early detection of chemical exposures of public health performance. Um, that uh, you know, report arose from Hurricane Katrina, but certainly storm-related response is not unique to the Poison Center. We do a lot of this work. So I encourage people, even if you know what to do medically with a given case, to, tr to give that information to your regional Poison Center because it allows us to find, if you've got two cases in one hospital and somebody down the street has three cases in their hospital and there's you know, another one two towns away, that's an outbreak. And with a bird's eye view of the poison center may be the first way that you could actually see it, just like that happened at our case conference back in July. So I will um, just conclude by pointing out all of the many spokes of the wheel of the benefit of poison control centers, um, whether it is in surveillance and reporting or saving healthcare dollars or managing you know, the ongoing opioid epidemic, providing education to the public as well as uh, healthcare professionals. We are accessible and free um, and serve all populations. So I thank everybody for your attention. And uh, I don't know, Mike, if you have anything additional to add and we can take some questions. Thank both of you. We really appreciate your detailed presentations and your in-depth discussion of this important topic and these developing cases and um, leading us all through how, how, it, all, how it all works and, and the extensive work that you're able to do and consultations you can provide through the Poison Center. And, I just want to remind folks that NDUS also has an ongoing collaboration with AAPCC, so we can get access to some of this information as well and submit queries to medical directors like Dr. Colello and Dr. Lynch to ensure that we're getting information on a timely basis about emerging drugs and drug trends as well. And we are obviously running a little longer than expected, so we're gonna move into our Q&A. And just a reminder to everyone, just before I start reading off some of the questions that have come in, please submit them using the Q&A box in writing, and we will run through them that way. And our first question is from an attendee who asked, how long does a typical jewel cartridge last, i.e. how many puffs? I'm not certain of the answer to that, and it's variable, as you might imagine. Uh, different sized people <laughs> take different sized puffs, um, so the number of puffs can be variable, but it's, it, it goes through much faster, you know, if you compare it to cigarettes, um, you know, you can take down uh, a Juul cartridge, uh, you know, a similar amount of time as a cigarette if, if, if you can kind of work at it or, or motivate it, but, um, you know, the, then be exposed to about 20 times the amount of nicotine, but the actual number of puffs will vary based on the individual using it. And our next question is, have you found any association between vaping and nerve damage? I'm not aware of that specifically. Okay. No, neither am I. Um, I. Yeah, I don't know. There'd be so many confounders uh, into the, you know, developing a neuropathy, if that's what you mean, um, by nerve injury. Uh, that, that it would be difficult to, to know, but I'm not aware of any direct connection or correlation. Okay, our next question is, would you argue that it is the THC itself or rather that the THC containing products tend to be acquired through unconventional sources like the black market 
and are therefore more likely to be contaminated with other products that could be causing harm. I can take a stab at that. You know, I think it is unlikely to be the actual THC component, the actual compound of THC. One theory is that maybe it is very concentrated THC causing the injury, but I, as I said earlier, I think it is more likely to be the vehicle, the liquid that's, that it's suspended in, or another, you know, chemical in the juice that's causing the injury, whether it's, I don't, I'm not sure it's actually contamination, meaning something in the THC itself, but it's probably just a component of what is required to get the cannabis plant into a solution that can be vaporized. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from a participant who would like to know when people do recover, do they generally recover completely from vaping associated lung injury or do they have some kind of lingering effects or continue to have ongoing health effects of some kind? I think that's gonna be a really important and interesting question uh, that, that is not yet answered. Um, you know, in speaking to some of my pulmonary colleagues, uh, they're just now starting to see these individuals in follow-up, one- and two-month uh, follow-ups. Um, and so there does seem to be some mild residual uh, diffusion capacity um, uh, elements or reductions, um, but not a definitive sort of uh, obstructive or restrictive pattern um, in, in the near short term. Longer term, uh, it's unclear. It's also, what will be interesting to see is re-exposure. So if any of these individuals go back to vaping, uh, will they once again develop uh, a similar injury or illness pattern, um, you know, indicating some sort of individual susceptibility. But uh, at this point, I think it's too soon to truly know the answer to that. Uh, and I'm, I'm aware of uh, multiple pulmonary groups who are, uh, whether officially or sort of unofficially, creating cohorts of patients that, to follow to, uh, to watch for exactly that. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question is, have any, do you know of any specific products, like retail products that may have been found in a vaping related lung injury? I, I don't think any of the typical uh, um, sort of the ones you could buy in a store <laughs> types of products have been right. specifically implicated. Um, you know, the, uh, Dr. Coelho showed the picture of the dank vapes. That one has been uh, talked about probably the most and identified by most users. Part of the issue with a lot of individuals is uh, we're limited to what they tell us uh, that they use. Um, and, you know, that, that may skew towards uh, a more um, traditional or, or legally regulated kind of product, whereas the illicit product may not be mentioned. Uh, the other problem is these, a lot of the illicit products have uh, quote-unquote name brands like Dank Vapes, uh, but they get mixed around and repackaged, so uh, you never really know truly what you're using. Uh, so I think that specific packaging and names um, will be difficult to track through this, uh, but from the, the jewels and the, the you know, blues and the more typical ones that you would buy in a store, uh, I have not heard of any one of those being more obviously uh, connected, though I've heard of each of them being mentioned by people who end up with this illness, uh, though the causation is not at all clear. Yeah, I agree. It's important to remember this is what's been referred to as the informal market, right? So the, the, it's made anywhere from, you know, a small operation like I showed you in the news article to even just a few cartridges or a little bit made in someone's basement or what have you. This is, um, it's coming from all over and the products are all different. And so it's, you can't really point to a specific product. Okay, thank you. And we have one 
participant who wanted to know if the poison control data is available to the public either at the aggregate level or the state level. So I know AAPCC releases annual reports, but is there anything else that you are aware of? So on the um, AAPCC.org website, uh, they actually have um, a, a number of um, pages and links that go to data uh, as they're collected on, on a very sort of broad level, meaning not down to the detail uh, of where they took place and the exact outcomes from each case. Those kinds of things can be requested uh, from the main office. But if you go to the website, uh, they'll show you the month-by-month -month breakdown of, say, e-cigarette cases, uh, and especially other ones of particular interest, uh, and a scroll of, of things that are coming in that, that's on the NPDES website, uh, but through navigating through there. And then otherwise, if you're more interested in something local at your, um, you know, in your state or at your, from your own poison center, uh, contacting them uh, to, to get uh, more local or specific data, uh, a lot of times that kind of request can be uh, less formal than the data access uh, process through the, through the national organization. All right, thank you. Here's a, a next question. Are either of you seeing any rise in the vaping of illicit substances such as fentanyl, methamphetamine, or synthetic cannabinoids? I have, I have not seen that here. As far as we know, we've seen a few cases that have been reported, um, but it's, it's very, subjective and, and a little bit of hearsay. Uh, it hasn't been something that I've seen be uh, a, a, like a, an outbreak, so to speak, um, but we are starting to hear more anecdotal uh, reports uh, of that occurring, uh, certainly synthetic cannabinoids, uh, but even opioid fentanyl related sub uh, compounds as well. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to see how many questions we're getting in. So I, certainly that shows that People are, are thinking a lot about what we've heard this afternoon. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to get to all of you, but I'm gonna roll through a few more now. And the next one is THC and CBD need to be baked at a higher temperature. Is that a factor? Either of you have an, an opinion or any information on that? Honestly, I think the answer is yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. as we're working backwards mm -hmm. trying to figure this out. Uh, almost anything could be a factor, the specific vape pen, what kind of metal is in the coil, uh, what, you know, what the cartridge uh, has had in it before, what's in the, uh, the compound. I think uh, Diane's right on regarding the extraction mechanism. Um, so uh, that could be a factor, but, you know, chemical reactions. Uh, can be different at different temperatures and higher heat may be inducing a different kind of reaction or product of a reaction uh, than at lower temperatures, but uh, that's very speculative uh, at this point. Okay, there were a couple of people who were wondering if there was a typical length of exposure before onset of, of lung injury and does that depend on the on the individual and what they're using, or is there any advice you could offer about that? Yeah, you know, I I, I know that it's not on the first use, right? I have at least I haven't seen or heard of any cases where it was used once reliably. History, you know, used once and then caused injury. Um, and it's on the order of, I think, a few days to a few weeks. Probably depends a bit on the concentration of what's being used. Certainly depends on the frequency of vaping. Um, and so I, I'd like to call it a, it's a subacute injury. I mean, it doesn't, like I said, it's not like if you, uh, you know, inhale a, a lot of toxic gas, all of a sudden you become sick immediately. It's more uh, that it does take a little bit of time to unfold. Mike, do you agree with that, or has that been your experience? Yeah, it, it is hard to know because um, a lot of people have been feeling sick 
for a few days, and in many cases they hadn't vaped for a few days by the time they came, but had been fairly regularly. So even going back to try to link it to certain products, um, over the course of two weeks they may have vaped three or four different types of products, maybe even with right. different friends. Um, and so you don't know, was it the two-week-ago exposure, the three-day-ago exposure, the cumulative uh, impact, one of those exposures within it? Um, you know, those variables are, are uh, all unclear and, and probably important, um, but difficult to, I think, figure out retrospectively, starting with an, an ill patient, um, because the, the stories uh, are very similar in their overall presentation, but the, the pattern of use uh, has been a bit all over the map. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna do one more question. And while we're doing that, I'm gonna launch a short poll. It's just a few questions because we like to get some input from everyone who participates in our webinars about how useful it was and what future topics you might be interested in. So I'd appreciate it if you would take a moment just to submit your answers to those questions. And in the meantime, also I will just remind folks that there's a lot of information on the NDUS website, NDUS.org, about vaping. We have set up a vaping page. So if you're interested in looking for additional information or other articles or reports that are available on this topic, you will find it there. And you can also, as I mentioned earlier, check out our earlier webinar and our more recent video with Dr. Michelle Peace, which will be available under resources along with the webinars and that is where this webinar will be posted when we make it available. So our last comment is from someone who is interested in knowing if you have any thoughts or recommendations for educational outreach related to vaping and if there are any harm reduction tools that are being developed or are available. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, anytime, especially when a lot of it is related to adolescents, the, the question, uh, and I know that we have at least some of our poison center educators who are probably more expert on the science of education or definitely than I am, but uh, it's always difficult to identify not just the message, but the way to deliver a message that's going to resonate, um, you know, uh, both of the, the immediate and, and long-term harms, in particular long-term harms are uh, difficult message to sell, especially when they're less clear, um, you know, but uh, I think discussing it, making uh, making sure the facts are, are, are front and center is key, and I know, again, that there's a lot of work going into identifying and responding to um, social media-based advertising and targeting, uh, particularly of adolescents. Um, but uh, as far as the, the information, I think just understanding uh, in particular the basic message is that these things uh, have, I think, for a long time enjoyed a uh, reputation for being really safe or harmless, um, and we clearly are understanding more and more that that is not the case. Uh, so I, I think that would be the, the, the theme or the premise foundation. I know NIDA and SAMHSA uh, have both uh, developed um, materials and handouts and um, uh, pictures and, and, you know, things like that that can be shared. Uh, so would, would certainly recommend uh, using those resources. And then locally, uh, poison centers all have educators um, and an educational mission. Uh, so they may be able to assist you locally uh, with their contacts and uh, accessibility and availability both of data uh, and of materials. Well, thank you very much. We're going to wrap things up now. And I, again, I really appreciate your presentations today and, and the discussion that we've been able to have on this important topic. And I just want to let everyone know that we are currently actively planning our webinars for 2020. And so please stay tuned for announcements on the NDUS network and through Twitter and our website. And we hope that you will join us again in the new year. And in the meantime, have a wonderful holiday season and, and a happy Thanksgiving. And we look forward to seeing you next year.